Hello. In our last lecture, we traced the ways in which Africa, specifically West and West Central Africa, became critically important in the making of the Atlantic world, the Atlantic system, mainly through the mechanism of the Atlantic slave trade. In this lecture, we want to bring our focus back to Africa itself, look at the way the slave trade worked on its African side, and consider what the long-term impact of the Atlantic slave trade may have been on the continent. Let's start by attempting to approximate the sheer scale of the trade uh, over the two to three centuries of its existence. How many people are we talking about? Like almost everything else about the Atlantic slave trade, this question has been hotly contested by scholars and, and non-scholars alike. Over the years, there have been some heavily biased estimates, as low as 2 million uh, and as high as 600 million. A century ago, the, the great African-American uh, scholar and historian W.B. Du Bois put it at, at 100 million, which turned out to be uh, almost surely uh, and considerably too high. We might start with Philip Curtin's 1969 study, which at the time it was undertaken was the most uh, meticulous uh, to that point. Curtin suggested a figure of about 9 million Africans uh, landed uh, in the, the New World. Uh, this takes us slightly away from our focus this time and back to the overview, but it, it is worth um, considering that something like half of the total went to the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, a bit less than a third of the remainder went to Brazil. In other words, the Caribbean islands and Brazil accounted for something like 80% of the total uh, African persons brought to the New World uh, under the Atlantic slave trade system. The United States, on the other hand, um, was responsible for importing less than 5% uh, of the total. As you might imagine, these figures create some extremely interesting questions for historians of the New World, and of course that lies outside of our, our purview. Now, Curtin was uh, attacked uh, in his calculation of these numbers by scholars like uh, J.E. Inakuri and Walter Rodney, who concluded that the total number was uh, probably at least 50% higher, perhaps 15 million persons. The most comprehensive study yet, which is represented by a database actually released on, in CD form um, uh, from Harvard, uh, led by the, the team of scholars directed by David Eltis and released in, in 1999, suggests the figure of around 11 million. It seems reasonable to estimate uh, a total, therefore, of perhaps 10 to 15 million persons most of them aged 15 to 35 years in the prime of their uh, physical productivity, and overall and in the long run at something like a two to one male to female ratio. The peak century, the, the, the slave trade of course varied from year to year, decade to decade in its intensity. The peak century was the 18th century, the 1700s, the same century as the European Enlightenment. History does not always run uh, in the same direction. Now, the numbers I've been talking about uh, above uh, do not include those who, who perished on the, uh, the, the hard middle passage. This, again, varied from place to place and over time, but seems to have uh, been in the 10 to 20 percent uh, range. Nor does it include those who were killed, injured, who died in the process of obtaining slaves and getting them to West African ports. Some have suggested what, what you might uh, refer to as a kind of multiplier effect, in other words, from the kinds of numbers I've been talking about, uh, as high as, as five to one, that is total casualties uh, required in a sense to produce the one enslaved person actually transported and relocated. 
Uh, if it is five to one, that obviously multiplies it many times over. Even if it were one to one, that would clearly uh, double uh, the, the number of victims. It's clear then that Africa lost tens of millions of people in the operation of the Atlantic slave trade. Although it is also true that this was over a fairly long period of time, again, two, two and a half centuries, three centuries at the, at the longest, and over uh, a fairly large area. Now, before we look at how slaves were obtained, let's uh, consider a, a related question. Uh, was slavery something brought from the outside, something previously unknown in Africa? The short answer to that is, is no. Um, but I hasten to add that we should not assume that, quote, slavery in Africa necessarily meant the same thing as the chattel slavery which became uh, the norm and which, with which we are familiar in, in the American uh, cases. There was in fact a wide range in African societies of what we might call uh, unfree labor, uh, a sort of halfway point. Some, some scholars have begun to use the term limbry, to, which of course has the same root as limbo. You're, you're in a sort of uh, in-between status between what we might consider uh, free versus, versus slave. So in these varieties, just to uh, try to, to categorize them a bit, some have proposed a, 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 a sort of too broad category um, division in, in African forms of unfree labor between what they've called royal slavery on the one hand, that is persons held by very powerful people, rulers. Uh, or at least uh, the elites uh, associated with them, and in considerable numbers. On the other hand, uh, uh, an opposing category which might be called domestic slavery, that is essentially on a, on a much uh, smaller scale and involving essentially a single household or, or, or family holding, as it were, a person in this status of, of, of limbry. In general, I would probably suggest that the royal slavery notion came closer to something like the, the chattel slavery of the New World, that the domestic slavery was, um, was considerably uh, removed. For instance, it was not necessarily perpetual. In the New World, slavery was intended to be an inheritable uh, status. The children of slaves were to be slaves. And once enslaved, unless emancipated by the owner or the society at large, one is a slave for, for life. Again, neither of those can be assumed, even in the case of royal slavery, uh, sometimes people were able, for instance, by uh, service inside a, a king's army, and in, in some cases, there are stories out of old Mali and so forth of uh, slaves who rose and became commanders uh, at some level within uh, the military. And certainly in the case of what I'm calling domestic uh, slavery here, or domestic limbery, if you like, uh, there was room for uh, adjustment of that status uh, over time. For instance, a male who uh, possesses uh, a person, uh, receiving it through perhaps uh, payment of a debt, receiving her, excuse me, I I'm referring here to a female, it was not at all unusual that that woman would be um, absorbed, as it were, into the family as an additional part of a polygynous household, uh, another wife. And that in time, the children of the owner and the slave would in fact uh, be absorbed into the lineage as more or less full uh, members uh, of it. Nonetheless, I, I don't want to minimize the, the possibilities and the, the fact of a range of, of unfree labor and at an extreme, it probably did include versions that, that would have uh, resembled the chattel slavery of the Americas. So, how did individual Africans then come to suffer the, the hard fate of becoming a victim of the African slave trade? What preceded their forced embarkation onto that ship from a place like Gore Island in, in Senegal, just off the, the shore of, of Dakar, uh, 
Elmina Castle in Ghana, these so-called doorways of, of no return. How did they get there? To say the least, uh, this is a very sensitive question because, of course, it raises issues of, of responsibility and indeed of, of guilt, if you like. Now, some slaves were, were certainly captured directly by Europeans. Uh, the very famous uh, novelization uh, of his researches, which Alex Haley published uh, in the 1970s, and of course I'm referring to Roots, um, the, the capture of, of Haley's ancestor, Kunta Kinte, is a capture uh, directly by Europeans and their, their paid retainers who come ashore, search for people, and find Kunta Kinte. In fact, in the in the, the, the TV series version of it, it's a, very, um, it's a very dramatic and indeed famous scene. And they're, they're literally using nets to, to ensnare. They're, they're in a sense um, um, capturing those people as one might get, get fish. Now incidents like this uh, certainly did occur. There were examples of direct capture uh, by Europeans and their, their immediate agents. However, they tended to occur either early on, before this, this dynamic really, really got rolling, or they tended to occur along the parts of the West African coast which were uh, either thinly populated uh, or uh, not the seats of reasonably strong states. And again, we related in a couple of lectures back the notion that thin population might be more likely to have a stateless situation and therefore be in less of a position to, to defend itself. But again, the, the number of persons uh, obtained and brought into this system through that means um, was, were relatively uh, insignificant. The principal reason for that was that African states were too powerful to permit it. And here I, I pause uh, to, to emphasize a point that I, I make to my undergraduates. It, it may not be uh, news at all to the listeners or viewers of, of this tape, but I do find that a number of them, in a sense, conflate the operations and the period of the, the, the slave trade with colonial rule or the colonial domination, the colonial takeover of Africa. In other words, the, the kind of uh, uh, impression they have is, is one where Afri uh, Africa was taken over by Europeans, uh, which then began a kind of systematic exportation of slavery. For a couple of exceptions, but in general, the era of the slave trade does not overlap with the era of the, uh, of the colonial period, and African rulers and states by and large, remained sovereign during the entire period uh, in which the slave trade uh, operated. So the great majority of persons brought onto these ships were purchased by European slave traders from powerful African traders, most of whom were connected with political rulers, kings or chiefs. This, however, simply raises, of course, uh, an additional question of how these brokers at the coast assembled their supplies of, of tradable slaves. Now, they may not at all have obtained them directly. I'm talking about the coastal um, entrepots and, and the rulers and traders uh, operating the trade there and making the final sale uh, to the, the European slave ship. They may not have done that directly. In fact, a given enslaved person may have been uh, sold and resold in several different steps from uh, a home or, or a place of origin deep in the interior uh, until reaching the, uh, the coast. An example of this comes from probably the most famous narrative and memoir of enslavement and eventual uh, freedom and a very moving book indeed, and I'm talking about uh, Alato Equiano's uh, memoir published first in 1789. He claimed that he was born in about 1746, so he certainly was one of the, uh, the victims of the African slave trade uh, at, its, at its height. Now, Equiano came from a place that was in the interior of what we would call uh, modern-day Nigeria. He was part of the Igbo 
um, ethnic group, which is the dominant people of, of southeastern Nigeria. In Equiano's case, he, he was kidnapped, though not by Europeans. Uh, and um, I'll just read the, the last sentence of his second chapter of his book. Thus I continued to travel, sometimes by land, sometimes by water, through different countries and various nations, till at the end of six or seven months after I had been kidnapped, I arrived at the sea coast. Uh, and there were a number of transactions involving him, uh, which, which eventually led domino style uh, to the, the final fate. Now, in some cases, the, the persons who wound up being victimized in this, this traffic were, were criminals, they were debtors, they were political undesirables, uh, dissidents or, or opponents of a, of a ruler, perhaps. In this case, in a sense, people were being deported, if you like, uh, rather than, than just exported. And again, uh, sometimes this, this creates a kind of, uh, of warping of, of, of norms, and I suppose this, this prefigures the end of this lecture when I talk about the long-range effects. Again, to go to Haley's uh, very popular uh, novelization of his, his lineage coming out of Africa and, of course, to the Americas, uh, there's a passage in the early portion where uh, he says that um, people began to wonder why when the European slave ships were, were anchored in the harbor for, for weeks at a time, that there seemed to be more in the way of, of court cases for serious offenses, that there seemed to be uh, a, a, a greater likelihood that mild criticism of the king or authority would result in, in imprisonment, etc., and, of course, he's suggesting that uh, these persons were, in fact, uh, going to wind up on that, that ship. But there's no question that the great majority of persons who went through those doorways of, of no return were the products of conflicts uh, of various intensity, of wars, battles, raids, kidnappings. These usually occurred between persons of different ethnic groups, or at the very least, different political uh, units. So, in a sense, what the African slave trade did was to create an alternative fate, an alternative fate for a person who, who might have been convicted of a, of a serious crime uh, earlier and might have faced corporal punishment, let's say, or, or indeed um, ostracism, exile, uh, ex, ex, uh, being thrown out, in, in essence, of the society, or a captive who might have been uh, incorporated into uh, royal slavery, as I've called it, or on a smaller scale distributed into a so-called domestic slavery, now there's an additional possibility. There's an alternative fate for such persons, and that fate, of course, is to wind up on a slave ship. A comment here, a personal comment, and I, I think I should make it clear that that's, that's what it is. Uh, I have encountered, uh, more than once, uh, Europeans or, or white Americans who, who seem to take satisfaction from the fact that most Africans brought involuntarily to the Americas uh, were sold by Africans along the West African coast. And the implication to them is that this uh, somehow shifts the, the blame, as it were, from, from European uh, onto to African shoulders. Now, for my money, uh, there's plenty of responsibility, guilt, if you want to put it that way, uh, to go around. Uh, though I would note in passing that the demand, which ultimately drove the system, came from Europeans, and I would note that it was not Europeans who were its victims. Now, for a more substantive point, the notion that, that Africans sold their, their own people assumes that, that African sellers, that Africans generally, thought of themselves primarily as Africans. But surely they did not. They thought of themselves primarily or first as Ashanti or, or Yoruba or, or Congo. A shared identity of Africanness, it certainly begins to emerge, but it takes a long time to, uh, to crystallize. Uh, 
uh, a notion of pan-Africanist identity, uh, etc. This should not surprise us. Certainly a sense of, of commonality, uh, a sense of common Europeanness, for instance, also has taken a very long time to, to crystallize as the long record of, of conflict, a lot of it bloody conflict, between various European ethnicities, various European states, surely, surely shows. As Basil Davidson uh, once put it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he said Africans rarely uh, sold their own people, they sold other people who also happened to come from Africa. Okay, some of the stories of the rulers who uh, became caught up in this, this slave trade are, are somewhat wrenching. Some are not. Some are, uh, inspire cynicism, uh, for sure. Um, but in the first category, I would put the story of the Manakongo, the king of the old Iron Age kingdom of Congo uh, on the west central African coast, near the, just south of the, the mouth of the, the Congo uh, River. The Portuguese first uh, came to the kingdom of Congo in 1490. So again, two years before Columbus um, and eight years before the Portuguese continued and successfully circumnavigated uh, around, around Africa. Um, Nzinga Mbimba became the Manikongo, the king, in about 1506 or 1507. And his story is a, it's a sad one. It's, it's a tragic one. At first, Nzinga and Bimba seemed to wish to seize upon a new possibility for improvement of his own kingdom and, if you like, a, a mutually beneficial uh, alliance and relationship uh, with the kingdom of Portugal. And indeed, this seemed to be possible for, for, for some time. There was, as maybe we should not surprise us, a religious aspect to this. And in fact, Nzinga and Bimba converted to Christianity uh, relatively early on in his reign. And in the Portuguese uh, records, he is referred to as Dom or King Afonso uh, I of, of the Congo. One reason this story is, is such a rich one in its entirety uh, is that uh, the evidence is extraordinary. In the Portuguese archives, there are 22 letters which were dictated and written by uh, uh, Afonso uh, and Zenga and Bimba uh, in the 1500s uh, to the king of Portugal, initially Manuel, whom he usually referred to as his, as his royal brother. It's clear that he wanted uh, some of the technical advantages, if you like. He was particularly interested, understandably, in ships and shipbuilding and was hoping that uh, he could get a hold of that. He's had uh, an interest. He, he was an engaging mind. He had an interest in, in Western styles of, of medicine. And as we've already seen, he certainly had an interest in, in Christianity. The Portuguese had an interest in a civilizing mission, and, and I don't say that cynically, uh, at, 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 at least at first. But increasingly, they also had an interest uh, in, in slaves. And at first, as part of the, uh, the, the price, if you like, that Afonso felt he had to pay to, to get those benefits that he wanted, he tolerated, you might put it, the dispersal, the, the sale of some slaves from outlying portions of his, of his kingdom. But as Basil Davidson writes in his, uh, his, his book on the Atlantic slave trade, he has a chapter entitled, um, At First a Trickle and a following chapter called, And Then a Flood. In a sense, the dynamic of the slave trade tended to, to overwhelm everything else, and Afonso wound up uh, being greatly disillusioned with it. He wrote a letter uh, at one point to his so-called brother king, uh, and I'd like to quote a minute from it. We cannot reckon how great the damage is since the above-mentioned merchants daily seize our subjects you're actually referring to African merchants there in the direct sense. Sons of the land and sons of our noblemen and vassals and our relatives, thieves and men of evil conscience, take them because they wish to profess the, possess the things and wares of this kingdom. 
They grab them and cause them to be sold. And so great, sir, is their corruption and licentiousness that our country is being utterly depopulated. That is why we beg of your highness to help and assist us in this matter, commanding your factors that they would send here neither merchants nor wares, because it is our will in these kingdoms that there should not be any trade in slaves nor market for, for slaves. Uh, that was not to be. Uh, and it's fair to say that uh, Afonso uh, died uh, bitterly disillusioned. And in fact, his portion of Angola became arguably uh, the, the hardest hit single place of the entire West African coast uh, in terms of the, the long-term numbers of slaves uh, extracted. Well, we know what came out of Africa in the Atlantic slave trade and human beings defined as property. What went in? Uh, as we might expect, a whole variety of things. Cloth, metal and glassware from, from Europe, tobacco, alcohol, cowrie shells and spices from the Indian Ocean. Maybe one commodity deserves special mention, and that is guns, some 20 million of them in all. African rulers often insisted on guns, just as the European traders insisted on slaves. At the end of the day then, or the end of the long night, if, if you like, how did Africa fare in this, in this bargain? What was the impact of the Atlantic slave trade? And as you can readily imagine, these are not easy questions. It's possible to discern two broad schools. One sees the Atlantic slave trade as thoroughly destructive, the largest single explanation for Africa's continuing impoverishment. Uh, Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, is a bold argument of this view, and, and the title, in a sense, uh, reflects that. That argument has been extended and, and made more subtle by scholars like uh, Patrick Manning and others. The other school is associated with people like John Fage and, more recently, John Thornton, who, while hardly applauding the slave trade and, and accepting its, its moral depravity, are particularly concerned to portray act Africans as historical agents, and not simply a sort of helpless uh, victims or, or or, or stick figures, puppet figures. Uh, on balance, and this is the one, one thing that Fage and Thornton point to, state building in the slave trade zones was not inhibited and indeed may have been accelerated. Uh, states like uh, Ashante or, or Dahomey in, in West Africa uh, certainly did develop in, at one level, uh, politically at least, um, and partly through their participation in the slave trade. We've seen a correlation between the rise of states and vigorous trade, and like it or not, the slave trade was trade. Now, Africa's population, unlike that of other continents, stagnated during the slave trade era. Now, whether this was the cause of economic stagnation or the result of it continues to be debating, uh, debated. There seems to be no avoiding the fact, though, that enslaved Africans and again, taken in their most productive years, produced wealth elsewhere, not in Africa. Walter Rodney argues, for instance, that if you want to look at this in very cold economic terms, exported people, in other words, what's coming out, were in a sense capital goods, that is, goods that produce other goods. I mean, that's normally applied to machinery these days. So he's arguing that productive goods, in a sense, in the form of people, are, are coming out while what's coming in is either consumable entities, uh, uh, consumer products, not capital goods, but consumer goods, and in fact, undercutting the further development of the manufacture of such things uh, at home. In other words, cheap imports of, of cloth or iron undercutting uh, and subverting uh, homegrown industries in those sorts of, of some things. And, he takes it one step further. Not only uh, are you not getting, well, not only are you losing the means of production, in a sense, in Rodney's argument, um, but you're importing the means of destruction. Finally, what of war and instability? What about fear and insecurity? What was the moral and social impact of uh, of this. I, I mentioned the, the kind of warping of, of political and, and legal norms that, that Haley refers to in his, in his popularized version there. Were the enslaved captives in wars 
were they taken in wars that would have been fought anyway? Or were they the bounty which stimulated the wars themselves? Were they the reason for the wars? You might call that the byproduct model versus the primary object model. John Newton, who was the most famous for composing the hymn Amazing Grace, had himself in mind when he wrote uh, who saved a wretch like me, he had, be begin, he had begun his career working on a, on a slave ship and then later uh, became an Anglican clergyman and, and very much felt uh, responsibility and guilt about this his whole life. He felt that most of, of Africa's wars would, as he put it, verily cease were it not for the demand for uh, the captives that those wars uh, produced. It's hard not to believe that this became at least a subsidiary motive for aggression uh, and, and conflict, and the primary one in, in some cases. And in any case, the conflicts were increasingly fought with more lethal weaponry, and that is guns. And what of, what of fear and insecurity? What of that, that feeling, uh, that gnawing at the, at, at the pit of the stomach, that, that kernel of fear at the back of the mind. Could it happen to me? Could it happen to my children tomorrow? What I know happened 20 miles away. I, I'm not sure how we, how we measure that. Speaking personally, I find it hard not to conclude that this sorry chapter in human history inflicted lasting damage. If history is drama, this episode is tragedy. Thank you.